everybody, it's Paola. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I have a very special guest with me. Uh, Donna, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us why you're back here today? Hi, everyone. I'm Donna Barba Higuera. And I was with Paola last year and we were talking about that book, Lupe Wong Won't Dance. And today we're back because my new book, The Last Quintet, Tista is coming out in a few short weeks, October 12th. I think it's moved a couple of times, but I think that is the final release date and the most beautiful cover I think I've ever seen in my life. I love the color scheme. I love that she has her eyes closed. Oh, the color scheme. I'm it's yeah. breathtaking. I love it. Yeah. The illustrator, her name is Raxen Marquez, and she is from the Philippines. And my understanding is that she's a fabric designer. This is her first book cover. And Ooh. my editor has this way of finding these amazing artists. And, she, and um, even the author for, or the illustrator for Lupe Wong, uh, he found them on Instagram. And they just had this huge following and she created this amazing, she read the book and created this amazing cover. And yes, the colors are just, they kind of show this perfect, you know, how one part of her world is one way. There's so much symbolism and yeah. beauty in the cover that you wouldn't know if you don't read the book. Once mm -hmm. you read the book, you're like, wow, she really captured so much. Yeah, I, I am in love with it. And I am sure everybody else is um it's just so stunning um <laughs> but speaking of the last quintista as a book and not just as a beautiful cover <laughs> uh who who did you write it for i would say when i i didn't go into writing it thinking of specifically who i was writing it for i thought i was i writing it probably for myself as a kid like kind of what who i was as a child which i had all these stories swirling in my mind like the main character Petra does and, you know, trying to figure out where to put them. Do I write them down? Do I keep them in my mind? Am I a storyteller? My grandmother was this amazing storyteller. And, and I would, I think I was kind of writing it for my kid self. I also am writing it for kids who feel like they want to escape their regular world this, these past few years have been really difficult. So I think it's a time where a lot of kids want to escape into something fantastical or, you know, science fiction. Um, but I also wrote it for kids who feel like they're told that they want to be something different than what either society tells them or their parents tell them that they should be. It, it's a book for kids to kind of read and go, wow, my goals and the things that I cherish and love are important. And, maybe I can hold on to those and become what I really want to be. And I don't always have to listen to society. Yes, you should listen to your parents, eat your vegetables, do those things. But sometimes when we have dreams and hopes, this is a book for people to not give up on those things to say, I really can do this. And like Petra become a storyteller. I love that. That's, that's really, really nice to say. Cause yeah, parents, Obviously, they have your best interest, um, but, you know, sometimes they get it wrong and that's fine. You know what's best, best for you as well. So this book is about diversity and memories, obviously storytelling and familial bonds. So was that something that you always knew you wanted to explore or were they like sneaking up on you as you revised? I love that you said that absolutely snuck up on me. And <laughs> I think that anytime I'm writing, I don't go into it thinking that my book is going to have all these familial themes and that it's going to be diverse. I'm just kind of writing what comes naturally to me. And Petra is a lot like I was coming from kind of these two different cultures and how there's complications of being mixed race and loving two different cultures and how Sometimes those two different cultures don't always love and accept one another in the real world, but as a child who is of two cultures, you love and accept both sides of your family. And, and so I wanted to show that in a book, how you, those can happen. Those things can twine and weave together and be beautiful, but also the relationship that, that Petra has with 
her parents is complicated. The relationship that she has with her grandmother is very much my relationship with my grandmother. So even when I was writing that opening scene of the book where Petra is with her grandmother and they're looking up at the stars and there's, you know, a, the grandmother's built a fire and there she's telling stories. That is absolutely a scene out of my childhood and just, you know, everything about it, I was describing my grandmother. And so even though I don't think I intended to, it just comes naturally. And that is my reality or was my reality as a child. I love that. So uh, The Last Quentista is a pretty intense book for mid for a middle grade audience, but I love that you don't shy away from that intensity. So uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced while writing and revising it? I would say the challenges came in revision. When I write, I, I put no filter on. I write exactly what I want to write. So even though in the back of my mind, I know, okay, this is a 13-year-old character. 12, she ter turns 13 during the novel. And so I know it's for a younger audience. Even though that thought is in the back of my mind, I am writing this book as if I were that character living this reality. And so I put no filters and there, it's an intense book. There's death, there's, there's betrayal, there's really things that in theory, yes, it's sci-fi kind of dystopian, but all of it could potentially happen. And so I didn't, I feel like we need to give readers credit and kids who are, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 and onward. There are a lot of kids who just are these amazing readers and we need to give them credit that they can handle these things. And that by reading this, it might help them grow as a person or ask themselves questions about what's happening to the character. How would I handle that? What would I do? And it's about growth and, and not everybody answers in the same way, but that's part of being a reader is putting yourself in that position and, and having an imagination and wondering what would happen. And yeah, some of it's so really sad, but I think that you have to give them the opportunity. So yeah, it's a little intense, but and we, there were some editing challenges when we went back and said, okay, is this scene a little bit too much? And so, but ultimately my editor and I, we didn't cut much. We didn't want to show anything graphic because I did want middle graders to be able to, to read this, but um, we pretty much left all the sad stuff and the intense stuff that happens. I loved what you said about giving kids credit because like kids are very very smart. I don't know who came up with the kids don't understand, blah, blah, blah. Kids do understand. Kids mm -hmm. are like beyond smart. So uh, thank you for, for saying that we should give them more, more credit with, with our stories. So this is the fill in the blank section. The first book I ever loved was. Okay. So the first book I remember loving, I would say was A Wrinkle in Time. The first book I bought with my own money was. <laughs> okay, so this question is really embarrassing. So <laughs> my parents, we didn't have much money. So if I wanted to read a book, I had to check it out from the library. I had gone to the library when I think I was like 11 or 12. And Mrs. Hughes would not let me check out a book that I had heard about. I'd heard the older kids talking about and I wanted to read. And she said I was too young and on top of that, I lived in a small town and she told my parents. And so, <laughs> so um, anyway, this book was Flowers in the Attic. And have you heard of this? <laughs> oh, no. I, I haven't talked to anybody about this. So I love that this is a question, but, and I haven't even talked to anybody about this book itself, but it's a weird book and it's kind of like has some really heavy themes. And so, and when I went to stay with my grandmother where my parents couldn't have, know what I was doing, my grandmother took us camping and we stopped at a store and I found the book in the book section. And I went and took my own money and I bought it. So I'm like, I'm going to read this book. So I pull out flowers in the attic and I'm like, read it. And I'm like, going, Oh my God, what the heck? is this? Yeah. I didn't understand a lot of it, but I also was like, who the heck are these people? 
wrong with them. So anyway, there's a reason sometimes that some yeah. books are inappropriate, but that's the first book that I bought with my own money. And I did it in a really sneaky way. And, but I, who would have, I never even thought of this in years. I love that you asked me this because I haven't <laughs> thought of this at all. That's so interesting though. I love that. My first book idea was. Was kind of weird. I, I always loved fantasy. So I always loved fairy tales. And even when I was young, I, my mom asked me that when I was little, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would answer, I want to be a fairy. And she, <laughs> she said, well, you know, you can't, fairies aren't really something that humans can become, but I was Aww. determined. And I remember when I finally realized that she was right, that I couldn't be a fairy. So my first book idea was about a girl who's going through her life in a regular way and discovers she is a fairy. But in this book, this girl discovers she's a fairy, but fairies are not what she thought they were. And they're very dangerous. And she ends up finding that she's really dangerous. So I wrote this book Ooh. about like, in all the stories she had heard, which at the time for me, we're very European. So she goes, it's a portal fantasy where she goes into this fairy world and all those creatures who she thought just like she, you know, thought she knew what a fairy was end up being these really creepy, weird versions. And it was just a really weird book, but I went down so many rabbit holes that the pacing was horrible. The book took forever. I don't think I'll ever, ever revisit that book, but it was kind of my first venture into writing a book. That was my first idea for a story. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> the song that reminds me the most, the most of my book is. There's an acoustic version of this song that's called Take On Me by Uh-Huh. Have you ever mm -hmm. heard this? And yeah. the acoustic version just slows everything down and it's very slow and thoughtful and it's really sad. And when I listen to it, I cry because I think of what it feels like, what this song is talking about is to love somebody so much, but you're okay. separated from them. And in this book, it, it reminds me of Petra and her relationships with her grandmother. That song reminds me a lot of just in loving someone and not being able to be with them in the way you want to be with them. And then the other one would, pro I don't know why, but I love, I love David Bowie. So anytime I hear something by David Bowie, I try to make it part of one of my books. I'm like, oh, this song is about my book. <laughs> and it, but I, I listen to this song Heroes and I think a, oh, it could apply to so many different books, but I listen to that song and I think of what a simple hero Petra is and how she, what is her, her, her weapon, her weapon is just stories and how she's taking these stories and conquering the future and making sure that, you know, she takes her folklore and mythology into space and into the future. And she, you know, is, so I imagine her, you know, walking with these, these like group of ragamuffin kids and they're going to this planet and all they have with them is themselves and their story and the folklore of their ancestors. And, I, so I think of that, you know, Heroes by David Bowie makes me think of that as well. That's so sweet. I love that. If you were a book, what section of the bookstore would you live in? Oh, I would have a tent right in the middle of fantasy sci-fi. <laughs> I'd, I'd have my lantern and a tent and I'd be sitting and reading all the books. You already talked a little bit about this, but um, what do you hope readers take away from The Last Twenty Quentista? I know we, I don't want to feel like, I don't want people to feel like, or for myself to feel like I have a responsibility because we all have to live our own lives, but we do have a responsibility to our ancestors and our elders and those who came before us. And part of it is to make them proud. And I think if we carry on the oral tradition and the stories of our cultures, and it, of course you can, you know, change them to how they apply to your lives, but I fear a little bit of the world has become so people don't sit down and sit and read books. People want instant gratification by clicking a button or watching something. And I, I would hope that people would maybe learn from this to slow down and listen to the stories that we tell one another and that our elders have told us and to maybe carry your own stories into the future as well. I don't know. I, it's a hope, but I don't know the world is changing. I love that. 
but that's very very important like it's called storytelling you you're supposed to you know connect with someone yeah. that way I I love that that's something that you're trying to get with with this book do you have any future projects that we should be excited about anything in the works that we can know about there may be more picture books coming Ooh. With, with Abrams kids possibly I've started a new a new sci-fi it's more dystopian a project that just stays place on earth but an, it's a a really bizarre story that in any time I come up with bizarre stories I always go, oh, no one will ever like this. People will think this is ridiculous. And then it ends up, somebody goes, oh, I do like that. So yeah, I, I, I keep writing, but I think like a lot of writers, our characters just constantly live on in our minds and they go on other adventures. And I just keep writing those adventures and hoping that one day I get to revisit them and write more books about them because they're like family. I love that. And I love that you're getting that response because your books are great yeah. and they deserve all the readers in the world. And I'm glad that It's expanding that you're getting, you know, the translation for Lupe Wong. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for doing wow. this with me once again, Donna. Yeah, thank you so much. I was so excited to hear from you. And yeah, this I love chatting with you. We have great conversations. It does not feel like, you know, it feels like we just are sitting, we're sitting by the fire chatting and talking. Yeah, thank you. I feel the same way too. Thank you everyone else for watching. Don't forget to check out the description below so that you can know where to get The Last Cuentista. And we'll see you in another one. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.